Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So it's fun to be back doing this. Um, it is a Thursday, filming for a Friday. Actually, I will probably be in France or Germany when this comes out. We're going to the Toman TGU, which is the Toman Gear University, I believe. So I'm not sure if any of you will be there, but if you are, I look forward to seeing you there. I know there's a bunch of uh, uh, YouTubers and other great people going. I saw Pete Thorne's name down that list and Glenn Fricker from Spectra Sound Media Group is going there. So it'll be fun to see those guys outside of uh, the screen and see them there in real life. So it'll be lots of fun. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already. Please hit the like button and most importantly, leave a comment or a question below. We get our Fat Friday questions from the questions below, so please feel free to comment. I will try my darndest to go back and answer as many directly as I can. I do spend a couple of hours a day answering emails and answering questions. I do that each and every day because this is really, really important. It is important to have a sense of community and to create a community where we all help each other. I respond well to people that respond to me. And when I go to other people's videos and I see them interacting, with people who are watching their videos, it pleases me. I am impressed because I know it takes a lot of time and energy to do that, but it is worth it. It is worth it because you're worth it because you make this community real. So please don't hesitate to leave a bunch of comments and questions below, and I will endeavor to try my hardest to answer as many as possible. Sometimes I do them all, and I try to do them all. We always mix singles, but when we want to make an album, how do we make the mixes of all the songs have a unique sound concept? Do we import all the parameters of our first complete mix to the other songs, for example? When I'm mixing um, an album that has a theme that maybe a band or an artist went into a studio, tracked all the drums, bass, guitars, and had a theme, and I listened to all of the roughs, I will may well make a decision based on, well, these five songs have a similar drum sound. This one sounds like it's recorded with three drum mics, so I'll treat that differently. This one's all program drums, and this song is a combination of the two. So what might I do? I might take one of those first five songs, just one of them, mix it, get it as great sounding as possible, send it off to the artist for approval, take their notes, maybe one, two, three recalls, get it slamming, make it sound amazing, and then move on to the remaining four songs with that kind of drum sound, with that overall sound, and take it from there. But I am very, very conscious, and I think you're implying this, that we don't make it sound like a really bad late 90s through mid 2000s rock record. And you all know what I'm talking about. Kids talked about it all the time. They would hear a single on the radio, they would love it, and then they would go and buy the album, only to find the other nine songs on the album just sounded like clones of the single, but not as good. You remember those days, the same drum sound, the same samples, the same everything on all 10 songs on the record. And we know how those guys and girls were making records. They would sit the drummer in a room, there'd be a click track, they'd play it down, they'd edit it to within an inch of its life, they'd throw in all their samples, then it'd be bass day or bass three days, and the bass player would play, and that would go off, and the Pro Tools editor would edit it tight, and there'd be guitars, and that would go off and get edited, and then they'd come and sing on it. And those rock records of that period, for instance, just sound quite bland. And so many fans said that. They said that they were forced into a situation of buying a single by getting an album. You, they were paying $17.99 at Best Buy or wherever it was because they really just wanted that single. And then they had to listen to nine other songs which sounded almost identical. So I'll get off my long diatribe, my high horse for a second, and say that obviously is what we want to avoid at all costs. One of the beauty of having your own equipment, of having your little interface, of having your nice three or $400 mid-priced microphone is that you can do things on your own now. You can get creative. You can do things out thinking outside of the box, and I applaud it and encourage it. So 
when it comes to mixing, yes, having systems isn't a bad thing. Having a template is not a bad thing, but it's the willingness to break out of that where necessary. So when we're talking about making albums and mixing albums and their songs with similar production techniques, of course I will take those settings and apply them to the next song and get it up to a level where it sounds amazing pretty quickly because I've learned acquired knowledge from one song to another to another. However, I want to be conscious to find what is unique about that song. If they've changed the snare, I'm not going to put this overriding crank snare on it so you lose all of the personality. It's an obvious thing. I know these sound like very obvious things to all of us, but having templates, once again, not an issue, not a bad thing. But remember to listen to the roughs or listen to the tracks before you put them through your template or your way of working and make sure that you don't lose what is unique about the sound. Now, it could be simple things like the toms got changed. It's a different kick. The cymbals got changed. The snare got changed. Any one or any combination of those things could have changed, even in the same room. We recently did a record with an artist called Chloe Yuka. It's going to come out. I'm not sure where it's going to come out. We're actually finishing it up now. And we went in, and you saw it at Sunset Sound. We went in the other day, and we worked with Matt Musty, who was an amazing drummer, and every song had a different snare on it. Five songs, five completely different kinds of snares. Black Beauty, Superphonic, wooden snares, different kinds of wooden snares, big snares, small snares, you name it, we had all kinds of different snare sounds. He also changed out the cymbals all the time. When we came to mix the songs recently, we took the sample of the snare itself. So at the end of the recording, he would hit a snare, and then we'd take that and fly it underneath. So yes, there was a sample in there, but it was the sample of the original snare. Just blended in underneath to keep a consistent hit but it had what was unique about those songs. That is the way to think. It's keep that originality. So yes, I do think having templates from one song to another is really smart, but make sure you're always listening to the song as a whole and referencing the rough mix. If they haven't given you a rough mix, bounce a rough mix. Think about that. You open up the session, do a quick balance of the session, pan it around, you know, get the balances so it's half decent, then bounce it before you get too carried away with doing tons of other stuff. Because that rough bounce that you have made will be your Bible, it will be the place you come back to because you know where it started before you got carried away with compression, EQ, multi-effects, you know, sending the DI backwards through a reverb and a flanger and a chorus and distorting it. You get my point. You need something to reference. And if they haven't given you one, the artist or the producer who, or the engineer who made the record, then make one for yourself because you want to have that clarity. You need to be able to listen within a focused method and be able to check where you came from. It's a very smart way of working. Do stems include all the processing like reverb, delay, compression, etc.? We've had a few stems conversations, so this one is a good one. Yes and no. Um, yes, because traditionally stems, at least the way I grew up and the way that the music industry thinks of stems, they think of it as a song. Let's just say traditionally it was 24 tracks on a, on a reel of tape. So maybe you took the lead vocal and all of its effects and print it as a stereo file. You would tend to take the backgrounds and all their stereo effects and print them as a separate stereo file. Then you would take the guitars as a whole, maybe all the rhythms or all the leads, sometimes all combined, and you'd print them with any effects. Drums, stereo files, same thing. So you would have these stems. However, the reason why I say yes, because the stems should sum up to the record, and I also say no, is because sometimes people specifically asked for things. So, they may want the backgrounds, but they may not want them with the reverbs. More likely, and very, very, very often, they'll ask for the lead vocal on its own with the effects printed separately. Now, you might ask, why would you need that? Well, think about it. If you've got an instrumental track and a lead vocal, and you want to do something like an edit to it, and you want to remove a section, 
You may want to turn up the reverb. You might want to choose the vocal reverb separately. You might want to bring it down in a section. You might mute a bar and you want the vocal to go dry. So you'll need the vocal with no effects. So think about that. It's quite frequently asked for. I remember when we did the Frey album with Michael Brower, he specifically did that. He created stems of a lead vocal. In fact, he did three. He did lead vocal with effects, lead vocal on its own dry, and then the lead vocal effects. Now, he could have done, you could have taken the lead vocal and the effects and combined them, but by him doing that, you got the sound of them interacting together. Because the other thing that's important about when you're printing through a console is that the bus compressor is affecting the other sounds. So if you've got 10 guitars going through the console, the bus compressor might be hitting in a certain way. If you start muting things, well, the bus compressor may not be doing anything. So it's important to think about circumstance and how you're going to do this. Personally, I think giving people options to build your mix independently for live shows and being able to have the elements and having the effects separate specifically and particularly on the lead vocals is a smart way of going. So if somebody asked me for stems, I would probably stem out stereo drums with effects, stereo synths, a bass, stereo guitars, maybe leads and maybe rhythms. And then maybe if there's an orchestra, stereo orchestra, then maybe stereo backgrounds. But then I would definitely do lead vocals, dry, the effects separate, and probably as a good guy, print it with the effects as well. That will allow them every single option they could ever think about. I've done it many, many times. Neil Avron provided us with some stems of Legendary Child from the Aerosmith record, and we did a stem remix for the movie because they asked for things to come up and down in a way that would have taken hours to do on a console, recall, redo stuff, where in a stem mix, we could put it together and do little tight edit mutes like mute something for just a bar, digitally remove that for a second and drop something else in there. So much more difficult to do on a console, you know, and really easy to do if a professional mixer like Neil Avron has supplied comprehensive, detailed stems. And professional guys and girls do that. So I hope you're enjoying this. Please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. But most importantly, this is the place that we find the comments and questions for future Fact Friday. So please leave one of your frequently asked questions below. I've been noticing problems with my work that I do on headphones. But if I were to buy correction software like Sonoworks, would that replace or just delay the need for new headphones? You're making me think of a, of, of a little bit of a quandary we had with speakers recently. Did you watch that video that we did where we used Sonoworks in here with different types of speakers. I believe we took the three that you see here. We took the Focals, um, the Callies, and the Genelix, and we used Sonoworks on all of them. And they all had varying degrees of amount of correctional work they did to each of them. What I loved about the Sonoworks is even after the speakers were flattened out, they still had their own characteristics. So what do I mean by that? Well, the Genelex still had that really great high-end detail that I love. They still had that low-end thump, which makes them a favorite of mine for just mixing rock and roll on. I mean, they're just big, loud, punchy. We spend a long time using those speakers. The Kali's not only already sounding great, got even better still. I mean, we all know everybody, every reviewer has said the same thing. For $300 a pair, there's nothing better on the market. So it was great. So they got even better. I mean, they suddenly got flatter still and wow, we were blown away. But the most interesting thing that we found was the Focals. Yes, they did some correctional work to them and they flattened out the high end and the mid range and everything. But what was interesting about the Focals is they still sounded like Focals. Now you're like, huh? What I mean is, is they still had a beautiful soft top end, not a soft, weak, but a beautiful, not fatiguing high end. So what did that teach me? It taught me that I really liked the sound of the high end on the folk house. You saw uh, Luca the other day in the studio DMI and Scotty Banks both talking about how they love those folk house. And I'm not here to sell folk house, but the point is, is that the reason why each of us individually like speakers, either combinations or whatever, or individual ones, is because they all have their own characteristic. And great speakers 
seem to maintain that characteristic even with correctional software because there's a little bit more going on than just frequency response. I mean, there's obviously a way that it's generated which brings its own sonic footprint. I'm not the genius. Many of you are. You can probably tell me why. So the Focals even flattened out still sounded like Focals. They still sounded like speakers that I could work for hours on without getting fatigued. And that is why people who like Focals like Focals. So, long answer to your question. Well, the long answer to your question is, is yes, ultimately a not very good pair of headphones that doesn't reproduce super highs or super lows very well, which is inherently what happens with cheap headphones. Cheap headphones don't have an extended low end or they have an artificial bump down there and they don't have a very good high end because they don't quite have the ability to reproduce in detail high frequencies. Both of those components require extra money being spent on them. So $50 headphones aren't going to sound like $1,300 headphones. They're not even going to sound like $100 headphones. That's just the reality. And that's okay. The Sonoworks will correct them where able to. It might say, oh, you're not hearing any super, super lows. However, a little driver in a cheap pair of headphones is, yes, you guessed it, not going to be able to reproduce super, super lows. It's just a reality. It's physics and it's quality of components. And that's okay. That's okay. If you know your cheap headphones and know how to get around the lack of response, you're okay. However, you're never going to make those cheap headphones reproduce super lows. You're not going to be able to make them reproduce super highs in detail because the drivers that are in those headphones aren't capable of doing that. What they are going to do with Sonarworks is get flatter and more even sounding so you can make better informed decisions on your mix. So my long answer to your question is yes. If you've got very cheap headphones and you want to hear a better frequency response and a more even frequency response, Sonarworks is going to help you better headphones are going to be better still. I think there's a lot of great makes and models out there. As you know, I love the blues. Um, they have super, super low. They seem to really go down there. They're, they're, one of the things is they're not fatiguing and they're also super comfortable. Eric is sitting behind the camera wearing a pair of blues. I think I saw him every day. Yeah, every day, almost every hour of the day in Germany and Austria. We were there a couple of weeks ago wearing those headphones. And he's still wearing them, so they've got to be comfortable. And all the artists that come in love them. Are they the best sounding? I don't know. There's millions of headphones in that price range that sound great. Well, not millions, but lots. I do know they're very comfortable, they're not fatiguing, and I'm already used to them and I can mix on them. And so can Eric. And people like them when they sit. However, as Audio-Technica, as Barry Rudolph says, make amazing headphones in the price range. Biodynamic make phenomenal headphones. I have a pair of DT1990s which are amazing. Focal make $1,200, $1,300 headphones which will make you cry they're so good. There's tons to choose from. Get the best headphones you can afford. Um, Sennheiser obviously make great ones as well. There's so many great headphones. Sonarworks themselves actually recommend, I believe, don't get me wrong, I believe the 650s is what they recommend and they talk very highly about them. So you have a lot of choice. If you're on the super cheap end of the spectrum and you're being forced in your situation in a dormitory room or a bedroom or some environment where you can't have speakers, then yes, invest in your, your headphones. It's probably the most important thing for you to invest in in that situation. I mean, your next step up should be a better listening environment. And if you can't get it with speakers, get better headphones before you pretty much buy anything else. How do you treat backing vocals in a mix? I make sure that they do not sound exactly like the lead vocal. Um, if I've got backgrounds, I usually, number one, narrow down the frequency response. Pretty much every mixer I've ever worked with shares that same philosophy. If you looked on my console here when I'm mixing hybrid, the low end is wiped off and the super, super highs is wiped off. They're narrowed. They're probably somewhere at about no lower than 250 and not much higher than 567K. I keep them pretty mid range and I may well boost some super mids or cut some super mids if it's fighting with the lead vocal. So I don't like a buildup of 600, 650, 700. That nasal area can get pretty exhausting, especially if there's some in the lead vocal. So I might pull out a little bit of that. Typically, I treat background vocals and lead vocals 
in completely different ways so that they have their own individual place. However, there are many, 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 many times where I'll leave the vocals big and wide and massive. And that's because it's probably a vocal or an acapella mix. And in that instance, I may want the vocals to be the low lows and the high highs. If I've got a choir and it's a cappella, there's no other instruments playing except for the choir singing, then of course, I'll leave the super lows in there. I want to be able to put on a pair of headphones, sit in front of some speakers and just hear the whoa, the lows and the high highs and just have the fullness. But in a band setting, even in an EDM dance mix, if it's dense, backgrounds tend to get shaved off a bit. And Often, I'll put a little bit of grit on there, just a tiny bit of distortion, a tiny bit of saturation, a tiny bit of tape saturation, just to glue them together a bit so the backgrounds feel a little bit more like an instrument. There's many, many other things you could do with backgrounds. Please feel free to let us know. And if you have any opinions on any of these questions and, my, of course, my answers, please give us your answers. I, I love sharing information and I love learning as much as I love teaching. I learn just as much from you. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing and I'll see you all again very, very soon. Mm -hmm.